after another, medics rushed patient after patient to the hospital from the city's west side. One of the latest incidents, a father who overdosed in his pickup truck with a child in the vehicle. Complete madness. It was one call to the next for heroin overdoses. In 24 hours, the explosion of heroin overdoses in Cincinnati seems to be getting worse. 30 overdose patients yesterday. Tonight, the number keeps growing. The demand for help reviving people who've overdosed is growing too. They're blue, lifeless. Emergency workers say each one was a heroin overdose. They found drug paraphernalia in many of the locations. On Winfield Avenue off Glenway, a person was found behind this abandoned house. Three people were passed out in a bedroom in an abandoned home on Rosemont Avenue, and all of them overdosed too. One man driving northbound on Beekman OD'd, rolling through the light at Westwood Northern Boulevard, and medics had another run on Winfield as well. Cincinnati police, fire and EMS crews have been hard at work tonight. You just said it at least 20 heroin overdoses at this hour. It has been an explosive night for overdoses. We're told that started about seven o'clock on the west side of Cincinnati tonight. Police tell us a six year old boy was in a truck with his dad at a shell station here off Hopple Street. His dad had OD'd and would not respond. People rushed over as that child screamed for help in the truck, hitting his dad, trying to get his dad attention. His dad's truck was parked here at the lot. He screamed for his dad to wake up, but he wouldn't. Heroin is the cheaper, more readily available replacement for people addicted to prescription drugs. But unlike prescription drugs, the supply is unregulated, the addiction unquenchable, the societal cost incalculable, and there is no end in sight. I grew up in Lower Price Hill, and like um, drinking and using drugs was kind of like a way of life down there. Like, not a lot of people worked, they'd hang out all day drinking, doing drugs, and various other things. When I had to walk out and go to school, I'm seeing people drinking on the corner, doing drugs, and you know what I mean? And it was like, it was appealing to me because everybody, everybody was doing it. I started smoking weed when I was about 16. And I also did cocaine for the first time when I was 16. Um, when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, they gave me a prescription of uh, Tylox. That was my first um, time doing opiates. And I liked it. And then I started doing like Percocet and, and stuff like that. And then like I barely made it through Elder. I barely graduated. And I was trying to play football. I was, I was at UC getting ready to play ball. And at the time, like I said, I lived in the neighborhood and there was a lot of distractions. And I, uh, I met, this, I met this, this, this girl and we started selling drugs together. And uh, I gave up on school and football. When I started doing the Oxycontin, um, I started stealing from my family, my, my parents. Um, I went to the jail for the first time. While I'm in jail, I noticed that I couldn't sleep and that I couldn't, um, I was restless. I was like, what's wrong with me? And they're like, you're detoxing off of drugs. I'm like, no way. And that was the first time like I detoxed off of opiates, but I really didn't know it because I didn't know what it felt like. So I get out and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to ever do that again. And uh, obviously it, I get right back to it. Um, I get on the oxys real bad, and I remember I was uh, I was trading I was trading cocaine to this guy in my neighborhood for his oxycotton. And the day I was doing it with him, he was doing heroin while we was trading. And I'm like, "What are you doing over there?" And he was like, "You know, if you did this, you wouldn't have to do that her uh, oxycotton. It's this is way cheaper and it gets you higher." Mm -hmm. So that was the day, the first day that I did heroin, and that like really changed my life for the worst. And um, you know, 
a lot of things followed with that. Um, I uh, I did heroin for 13 years, 13 years, and then I ended up in prison a few times. Um, I was in and out of treatments. I've been to every treatment you can think of. Uh, I tried medically assisted uh, medication like methadone and suboxins. It didn't work for me. It just didn't. And uh, I lived hard for a long time. I went from having this, you know, graduating from Elder High School to being possibly being able to play Division One college football to living in the streets and sleeping in abandoned buildings from my drug addiction. And I lost everything. And I lost respect. I lost all hope. I never thought I was going to be nothing ever again in my life. Essentially what happens, and this is the nuts and bolts of how addiction works, um, some substances have potential to uh, build up tolerance, have your body build up tolerance. For example, caffeine. Let's just take a very simple example. Um, I drink one and a half cups of coffee every single day. Um, my husband can drink four and have the same effect. And I really know I don't need more than a cup and a half of coffee every day. But if I started taking a little bit more of that coffee, then I would probably need two cups to get the same effect. And then before long, I would need three cups to get the same effect because my body has built up tolerance and I get used to what that caffeine feels like. So then in order for me just to wake up in the morning, before long, I'm gonna need four cups of coffee just to get out the door. So that can happen even on a very basic level such as caffeine. But if you think of something like an opiate that you take to mask pain, um, and the potential that that has on remapping the wiring in your brain because essentially what it does is it affects sensors and things in your brain, right? So that you don't register pain. Um, over time, you're going to need more and more and more of that to achieve that same effect. And initially, in the beginning, it's a high. So if that happens, then you're basically reaching a potential where you're going to need a great deal of prescription drugs to reach the same effect. And what that did is basically created the unintended consequence of someone saying, well, hold the phone. I can go out there and find it much cheaper in a different format. So that's kind of what happened with heroin. Uh, March 11th, 2013, uh, I got out of a treatment and I had no idea that I wanted to be sober. I didn't even know if it was possible for me. And I went to New Foundations and uh, I started doing uh, AA, 12-step fellowship. And... Uh, my life changed. Today I've been I've been sober for five years. Um, my job is helping people get sober. It's like I used to always think like, man, why did I end up on drugs? Why me of all people? Because I was like the person in in my neighborhood that was not supposed to mess up and get on drugs. I was supposed to be like the su success story. And now I kind of see that God had a different plan for me. You know, and I took like my worst affliction and turned it into my greatest asset. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like in a small part of what, where I'm at with it. There's some people who still enjoy what they're getting from it. And then there's another part that they have tried to quit before and they physically are ill when that happens and they don't want to go through that again. So they're kind of stuck on they don't want to go, they don't want the pain that goes along with it, depending on how they started. Some of it is with chronic pain, so they know if they stop taking it, the pain is coming back. Mm -hmm. So there's really, it's not an easy one to kick because a lot of people start it because they have another problem that they're using it for. Like once you get into those real strong opiates and you're doing them every day, Past seven to ten days, the choice is gone. You have to have it. You become, you become, uh, they call it dope sick in the streets. You, you go into withdrawal. Your brain tells you you must have it. It's like it, you must have it. And there's no like, I'm just stopping. It's once that got you, it's over.
essentially they use a law enforcement officer, a paramedic, and a mental health caseworker um, through like a local treatment program. They go door knocking for people that have recently overdosed and try to link them into treatment. The odds of them right at, right when they get brought back with the Narcan, that's not when they're going to say, yeah, I think I need help, because that's more when they're trying to get away from what's going on because yeah. they think they're in trouble, they're trying to avoid, okay. which is where they're saying, if you, you try to get to them within 72 hours, but not right now, yeah. because most are not likely, because okay. no, yeah, and no recovery works because someone else told you you had to. Like if you don't want, if you don't want the help, it's not gonna work. So the quick response team is basically offering the help, giving them options. Um, if family members are there, giving them the card, here you go, like work with them, talk to them. When they get to that point, if you talk to them before we do, push them this direction so that we can try to get them some help. I think we don't have enough resources for, for people because I get calls all the time and I only got 210 beds at my job. And the biggest thing is people will call me and they'll say, Aaron, I need to detox. I'm not a detox facility. There's only one, it's the cat house. They only got a certain amount of beds. And then addicts and alcoholics windows of when they want to change, open and close. Mm -hmm. One day they'll be like, I'm done, I'm ready to quit. And then I'm like, I have nowhere for you to go. Three or four hours later, they stumble across some money. They get high or drunk again and then that could keep them back out there for two weeks, two years, you know what I mean? When we had that opportunity, but there was nowhere to put them. Yep. You know what I mean? Or get them help. A lot of stuff people do in addiction that's not the real them and I know they cause a lot of harm and a lot of people like have uh, you know they feel a certain type of way because their interactions with addicts was bad but I believe everybody's worth uh, helping and, and not giving up on because once them people once addicts get sober they're some of the most like loving people hard-working people you'd ever meet People do get better. And I know people who have gotten better. And when they, they do, like, yes, they can do amazing things. So they're not throwaways. They're people just like you and me. They're, we're all people. So what extent should we give up on others? When do we give up on our president? When do we give up on because we don't agree with them or because they make bad decisions? Or, um, I mean, when do we give, how do, who is to decide when someone should be given up on? At some point in time, we have to start caring about other people and trying to help them. So, yes, you might think that this addiction doesn't affect you now, but it might. It might be you, it might be your family member, it might be someone else. And if we don't have all of these systems set up to help, we're gonna dwindle. If they'd have just let me die, I wouldn't have my sons. I wouldn't, I got to experience all the things I've had. I wouldn't be here to help all these people struggling in this heroin epidemic mm -hmm. if they would have just let me die. Because it's so prevalent, it's so around that everyone's gonna be in contact with it, whether it be positive, negative, family relation, or some kind of relation to them. It's just a lot right now. There's, it's all over the place. So it does affect everybody.